Welcome to Legal Toolkit, bringing you the latest legal trends and business initiatives to help you manage your law firm with your host, Jared Correa. You're listening to Legal Talk Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of the Legal Toolkit, as always, here on Legal Talk Network. Uh, if you were looking for the new season of Transformers Robots in Disguise on Cartoon Network, I have some bad news. It's been canceled. Yes, I watch a lot of cartoons. If you're a returning listener, welcome back. If you're a first-time listener, hopefully you'll become a long-time listener. And if you're Kyrie Irving, I am very delighted to have you in Boston. As always, I'm your host, Jared Korea. And in addition to casting this pod, I'm the founder and CEO of Red Cave Law Firm Consulting, which offers subscription-based law practice management consulting and technology services for law firms. Check us out at redcavelegal.com. That's R-E-D-C-A-V-E-L-E-G-A-L.com. I came up with that all by myself. You can buy my book, Twitter in One Hour for Lawyers, from the American Bar Association on iTunes, at Amazon, and probably also at Green Apple Books in San Francisco, California. Here on the Legal Toolkit, we provide you each month with a new tool to add to your own legal toolkit so that your practices will become more and more like best practices. And in this episode, we're going to talk about diversity or the lack thereof in the legal profession. But before I introduce today's guest, let's take a moment to thank our sponsors. First, I'd like to thank our brand new sponsor of the Legal Toolkit podcast, and that is Thomson Reuters Firm Central. Firm Central is a cloud-based legal practice management software that streamlines your day and automates non-billable administrative tasks so that you can accomplish more with less. Check them out. Next is Answer One a leading virtual receptionist and answering service provider for lawyers. You can find out more by giving them a call at 800-ANSWER-1 or online at www.answer1.com. That's www.answer, the number one, dot com. Last but not least, Scorpion crushes the standard for law firm online marketing with proven campaign strategies to get attorneys better cases from the internet. Partner with Scorpion to get an award-winning website and ROI-positive marketing programs today. Visit scorpionlegal.com forward slash podcast. Okay, today's guest is Gina Cho of JC Law Group PC, where she practices with her husband. I don't know how they do that. If I practice with my wife, we'd probably be open for a day before we killed each other. Gina is a lawyer, an author, a mindfulness instructor, and a wellness consultant. Gina's written two books. The Anxious Lawyer, An Eight-Week Guide to a Joyful and Satisfying Law Practice Through Mindfulness and Meditation, and How to Manage Your Law Office. She also writes for Forbes and Above the Law. Gina speaks across the country about lawyer well-being, law practice, mindfulness, and diversity. She received her BA and JD both from the University of Buffalo, and today she's here to talk to us about diversity. So Gina, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Excellent. This is great. So I'm a JC too. Does that mean I can be an honorary member of your law group? And would you pick up my malpractice insurance? Of course. Oh, beautiful. I'll run it by my husband. Yes. Let me know. I'm interested. (laughs) Sounds good. (laughs) All right. Let's roll here. Let's get right into the questions because I think this is a very interesting topic. So let me be as blunt as possible here. The legal profession, as you know, is not generally known for its diversity. And this is coming from a middle-aged white guy speaking into this microphone. So can I ask you, in your opinion, why is it that the legal profession is not more diverse at this point, especially when you see other industries making advances in terms of diversity? Yeah, you know, I don't know that there are actually that many industries out there that are making headways in diversity. I mean, I think legal is probably lagging behind, but when you look at the diversity in terms of the management teams on Fortune 500 companies or even our Congress, it tends to be still pretty white male. Um, you know, in terms of why I think there's not as much diversity in our profession, and I think you know, there's a couple of things happening. One is that humans are just naturally tribal, right? Like we kind of grow up with people that are like us. So if you're white, you tend to sort of live in white neighborhoods. So you go to you know, kindergarten and first grade with other white folks, and then you kind of work through your schooling. 
And, you know, when you get to law school, kind of same thing, you kind of hang out with people that look like you and have similar backgrounds. And they think that there's just sort of that perpetual, you know, wanting to just kind of hang out with people that are like you. And the social science research is actually fairly strong on this, that if you're not exposed to a lot of diversity from when you're a kid, it's actually much more difficult as an adult to kind of break that implicit bias that you may have against people that are different from you. Um, And also there's just a historical behavior in our profession, right? Like if you look at the Supreme Court, for example, we didn't have a woman justice until 1981, which is fairly recent. Um, so, you know, I think there is just that sort of inertia of, you know, institutional bias that's been happening for, of course, hundreds and hundreds of years, pretty much since the founding of this country. And you know, I think we're just still seeing the residual effects of that. That makes a lot of sense. I think that's a good explanation. You know, like, as a extremely handsome man, I'm always hanging out with good looking people and it does rub off on you <laughs> after a while. All right. So let's talk about what firms and lawyers are trying to do. So you hear a lot even though there hasn't been much traction about big firms trying to make pushes for diversity, are they actually making any gains? Um, You know, when we look at the data, it doesn't look like it. So when we look at the study from the National Association of Women Lawyers um, and look at the women in law firms for the past 10 years, equity partners in 2007 was about 16% women this year was 19%. Mm. So, you know, that's not a whole lot of traction. And when we look at the associates, however, back in 2007, we still had about almost 50% women coming in as associates. So we had 47%. And when we look at the number from this year, we actually went backwards and we're actually at 46%, which Mm. is not very promising (laughs) at all. Um, And of course, when we look at other dimensions of diversity, for example, people of color, only 6%, um, and this is talking about the AM100, Mm -hmm. the big law firms, um, our equity partners, um, women of color only make up 2%, the LGBTQ community, again, 2%, you know, and of course, lawyers with disability make up less than 1%. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're just not doing that great in terms of all the different dimensions of diversity. I'm glad you brought statistics, but now I'm a little depressed. So- yeah. <laughs> Not a lot of great gains being made by big firms, right? So in that environment, like, do you think, and I know there's not a whole ton of data on this, but do you think small firms are making better progress than big firms? And if they are, how are they doing it? Or if they're not, how can they possibly get to that point with so many small firm owners just drowning in business management issues that a lot of big firm lawyers don't have to deal with? Yeah, you know, I don't know, because I mean, there isn't a whole lot of data on that, but you know, I think that Certainly as individual lawyers, right, there are things that we can do to increase diversity and inclusion in our profession if that's something that's important to you. Um, I certainly think, you know, there's sort of general data about women and people of color opening businesses at a much, much higher rate in the United States in general. Um, and I would kind of think that that's true in our profession as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, just from, you know, kind of looking around, yeah, I'm noticing that, you know, women lawyers are kind of saying, you know what, we don't want the big law lifestyle. And they're actually partnering up and forming small law firms. Mm -hmm. Um, Same thing for people of color. So, yeah. So do you think that's a good or a bad thing that lawyers of color or women lawyers are opening up their own law firms to get out of the big firm culture. Do you think at some point that's going to mean that those women-owned or minority-owned firms are going to become big firms that can compete with the more white-bred firms? Or is it bad that people just have to get outside of the system to make any headway? And I think it's a huge loss for the big law firms, right? If you're losing essentially at least half of the workforce, you know, women, and then of course when you look at the people of color, I mean, you know, the minorities, and I'm using my air quotation marks here, <laughs> will fine. no longer be the minority in very short order. I mean, when we just mm-hmm. look at the data, you know, about, I mean, in very, very short time, you know, in our lifetime, where there's not going to be a single racial majority in the United States. So, you know, if law firms actually want to survive and they want to attract the best talents, and unless you think the best talents are only white men, I think they're going to have to change. So I think it's a matter of, you know, their sort of survival um, and they have to shift. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit more about some practical effects of this coming up in the next section. But for now, we're going to take a break. This is all the stuff you need to buy. Firm Central cloud-based legal practice management software for solo and small firms 
provides a single online location for all of the tools you need to manage client files and perform client work and offers unrivaled integration with Westlaw. With Firm Central, you can securely store and organize documents and case files, manage time tracking and billables, and collaborate with clients through a secure client portal from anywhere there is an internet connection. Is your firm experiencing missed calls, empty voicemail boxes, and potential clients you'll never hear from again? Enter Answer One Virtual Receptionists. They're more than just an answering service. Answer One's available 24 seven. They can even schedule appointments, respond to emails, integrate with Clio, and much more. Answer One helps make sure your clients have the experience they deserve. Give them a call yourself at 800-ANSWER-1 or visit them at answerone.com forward slash podcast for a special offer. Hey, thanks for coming back. We were here the whole time. Gina came back too. (laughs) So let's now reset with Gina Cho of JC Law Group and diverse other things that she does, who's here for us today to talk about diversity in the legal profession. And in the first section, we sadly, but probably not unexpectedly learned that there's not much diversity in legal, especially in large firms. So let's talk about this like old white guy problem, because it's not just an old white guy problem, it's also a young white guy problem. There's just not enough diversity in firms as it stands. So let's talk about an issue that I've been seeing here and there. The people who are inheriting firms and taking on firm management roles look a whole lot like the people who are leaving those jobs. So Mm -hmm. we touched on this a little bit. So is this solely a question of more minorities? And I'm, I'm throwing the air quotes on there again as well, launching their own practices. Or are there other ways to make strides within traditional law firm management structure that could be brought about by a new class of, for lack of a better word, white guys who are taking over these firms? Is there hope for the next generation of firm owners? I think so. I mean, what I'm noticing is that especially with the younger lawyers, they you know went to school and they sort of grew up in a more diverse community. Um, so they tend to be more open. But you know, I think frankly, what needs to happen is that everyone at the firm needs to be responsible for increasing diversity and inclusion. Like what I see often is that the firms will say, "Well, we have this diversity and inclusion problem. Let's form a diversity and inclusion committee," which tends to be made up majority of people of color, women, and you know, folks from the LGBT community, but they're actually not the people in power who can actually institute these changes, yes. right? Or they'll yes. hire a diversity manager. <laughs> and I think what needs to happen is we have to get the partners, the equity partners, the white male like yourself to the table um, and you know, just ask the question, like, why is diversity and inclusion important to you? Why does it matter? And why should it matter for you know, the, the gray-haired white men? Um, and I think there can be some discomfort in actually standing up and saying, you know what, I'm looking around the table and I don't see any diversity, you know, like everyone at the table looks like me as a white male, right? Because then you kind of run into that risk of having your friends look at you and say, well, why do you care? You have a seat at the table. (laughs) So I think it takes a certain amount of courage to say, well, diversity and inclusion is important to me, despite the fact that I'm a white male. And it, you know, it's sort of exercising your privilege, right? And actually spreading that power so you can be more inclusive. And just to be clear, I'm not a white male equity partner at a large law firm, but if anyone wants to offer me that position, I am open to take calls. (laughs) So Gina, do you think part of the problem too is that when people refer to this issue, they like call it a problem, like the diversity problem. Would it be better to start referring to these things as like diversity solutions instead? Yeah, I think that's a great reframe. Um, or, you know, just thinking about it in terms of creating a more inclusive work environment where, you know, we have people that are different and just all the dimensions that humans are different feel like they can be themselves at the office and feel comfortable being their best selves. Yes. I'm just eccentric, not a minority. So there you go. that's my problem. So let's talk a little bit about where the solution starts potentially before we get to the law firms. So is part of this about getting different people into law schools in the first place, people with different backgrounds, different ethnicities? And then if that's the thing, getting more people into law school, adding diversity to law schools, how is that accomplished if law firms can't do it? Yeah, I think law schools are actually doing a fairly good job of increasing diversity uh, in their incoming class. There is hope. Um, cert- 
There is hope. Yeah. And I mean, certainly women have been graduating, although the research shows that women have been graduating at 50% or higher in the lower tier law schools. Mm. But, you know, I mean, certainly we've been having women going to law school at, you know, 50% rate or higher for the last few decades, or at least the last, let's say, a decade or two, Mm. which would then suggest you know, those women should have sort of worked through the ranks and become partners or equity partners by now, but that's not translating. So I don't know that it's so much a matter of getting, I mean, I think certainly that would be helpful, right, to get more minorities and, you know, LGBT community folks into Mm -hmm. our law schools. But also I think law firms really need to sort of embrace, you know, as a whole, um, this idea of diversity and inclusion being a part of the fabric of who they are. It needs to become part of their identity and not something that that committee over there is responsible for. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I like that. Okay, so there's a term you brought up uh, in this first section, which is kind of a loaded term, this idea of unconscious bias. So, and I think most people have heard that, but I don't necessarily know that they know what it means. So can you explain that a little bit more? And then can you also talk about how attorneys themselves can become more aware of this in an effort to increase diversity and inclusion in law firms, in law schools? Sure. Um, So unconscious bias are biases that we all have. And I think that's really important to emphasize against different um, groups of people um, and also just people that are different from us. And, you know, these can be things that we learn or absorb as children. It could be things that we learn, you know, as adults. I mean, it could be like, you know, something really silly, like you prefer red Um, I don't know, like you prefer yogurt over milk, I don't know, for breakfast or whatever it might be. So, you know, and and I don't mean to suggest that like we want to get rid of all the unconscious biases because, you know, sometimes you just need your unconscious bias. Like you just need to kind of be able to go into your closet and pick out your favorite clothes and put it on without Mm. having, you you know, your mind kind of go through a 46 step check um, (laughs) to figure out what you're going to wear in the morning. And in terms of, you know, what individuals can do, and I feel very, very strongly that we're not going to have diversity and inclusion at law firms or any other organizations until the individuals within that organization are actually willing to look at their own unconscious bias. So, you know, I've done a lot of research on this. I've also sort of done work you know, in my own life to see, you know, what are the unconscious biases that I have? So I think it's important to start with the question of why, right? Why is diversity and inclusion important to me? And I think sometimes for like the white men, they're like, well, it's not really important to me because I got in and I'm going to just you know, slam the door behind me. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had, you know, white male tell me, well, you know, diversity and inclusion is important to me because I have daughters or I don't know, you know, and so there may be different reasons for why diversity and inclusion is important to you. It might be that you're a lawyer and you think that having a more just and equitable society involves having a more diverse and inclusive workplace. So that could be your reason, but actually having some clarity around why it's important to you. And also, you know, so I would say like start by looking at your own network, right? Like look at the people that you interact with, um, your friend circle, and look and see, you know, is it diverse? Is it inclusive? If you're a white male and you tend to hang out with other white male, you might say, huh, isn't that interesting? Um, And maybe, you know, make some conscious effort to try to kind of expand your circle. Even just looking at your, you know, social media. I read this really interesting article about social media and how there's a much, much higher rate of white males um, that use social, like especially Twitter, than um, other populations. So I actually went through and looked at who I followed. And I was kind of shocked that I was following like you know, a much, much higher percentage of white males and other groups. I made a conscious effort to go and find people. Um, and Twitter is such a wonderful venue mm-hmm. for this, right? Because you can find people, you know, if you're, if you want to learn more about what it's like to be a lawyer with disability, you can literally go and find that person on Twitter who yes. is a lawyer who is very public about his or her disability. And also just look at, you know, like your bookshelf and see, you know, is what am I consuming? Again, this was a blind spot for me because I was finding that I was reading a lot more books <laughs> written by white male than other groups <laughs> of people. And it's like, huh. Um, so, you know, I want to just make it very clear. Like, it's not like just because I talk about this stuff that I'm somehow like above <laughs> board and that I don't have any unconscious bias either. 
um, you know, what thing that I started doing is actually attending, you know, uh, CLEs at either other minority bar or women bar or LGBTQI bar associations. So kind of exposing yourself to different groups of people, right? So if you tend to go to your local bar association and that bar associations tend to be very white, you know, go to an Asian American bar association CLE or, you know, the Black American bar association CLE. There's also really great test on Harvard. It's called um, Harvard unconscious bias test. And I found that to be fascinating because I certainly didn't think that I had biases against certain groups of people. But when I took the test, I actually found that I had um, a fairly strong bias, unconscious bias against Black people. And I was like, wow, that's so weird. <laughs> and so yeah, but you know, it, it's also really informative just in terms of seeing your own, you know, unconscious bias. And also, if you're a white male lawyer, like there are things that I think you can do to sort of um, you know, help, or I don't know, just kind of just something very simple, like, you know, who are you mentoring, right? Are you mentoring other lawyers that look like you that, you know, went to your law school? Or are you mentoring someone that mm-hmm. is different from you? You know, go to your local law school and talk to the minority bar association there, especially if you practice in an area that tends to be very white male. So I think there are lots of different mm-hmm. things that we can do as individuals to fix the diversity and inclusion problem. That was a lot. That was a lot to unpack. Um, tell me you didn't throw away your Thomas Hardy collected works, though, when you were purging your bookshelf. <laughs> Keep some of those white guy writers. Um, all right. One thought you had at the end there was about CLE, and we're going to come back mm-hmm. and hit that on the other side. But now, while I look for new recipes for sturgeon, listen to some words from our sponsors. Do you feel like your marketing efforts aren't getting you the high value cases your firm deserves? For over 15 years, Scorpion has helped thousands of law firms just like yours to attract new cases and to grow their practices. As a Google Premier Partner and winner of Google's Platform Innovator Award, Scorpion has the right resources and technology to aggressively market your law firm and to generate better cases from the internet. For more information, visit scorpionlegal.com forward slash podcast today. Oh, look at that. You came back again. Good for you. How was your frosting sandwich? It was delicious. Yes, that's a real thing, by the way. Do you actually eat frosting sandwiches, Gina? Just to digress no. for a moment. Like no. two pieces of bread, <laughs> cake frosting in between the two pieces of bread. That was my jam when I was a kid. Of course, I can't eat it now because I'd weigh 700 pounds, but it's delightful if you haven't <laughs> tried it. In any event, let's re-engage now with Gina Cho who is humoring me right now, of JC Law Group over questions of diversity in the legal profession. So I know, because I am on many of these myself, but why are there so many all-male, all-white panels at legal conferences, events, and CLE programs? You know, I think we have to go back to that tribal mentality, right? Like, what do most conferences do? Like, you have the conference um, organizers who you know, if you have all white male conference organizers, they're going to just say, okay, like who are the friends that we know and what are the topics we want to talk about? And then they go and invite their buddies. And then that's how you end up with an all white male, you know, panel and conferences. And yeah, so I think that's sort of the very simple explanation in terms of why that happens. All right. So let's move on then. Do you think there are things that program organizers can do to promote diversity on panels, practical things that they can do. Even the all-white organizing committees, what should they be thinking about? Yeah, I I think the first thing to do is actually expand the planning committee and you know, I mean, I think it's a problem if you are trying to reach the, you know, your entire legal community, but you don't have representation at the planning committee stage. So I think that's a really great place to start. Like if you're, you know, all white dudes sitting around planning a conference, you might say, hey, you know what, it might be good to have some women here, or maybe some people of color, because um, they might actually have different ideas about, you know, different panels or topics that would be of interest to people that are not like us at, <laughs> that are coming to the conference. And I think, I mean, just kind of pausing for a moment, like, and so I go to a lot of legal conferences, I, I speak at a lot of them. And I think that, you know, that like, if I walk into a conference room, 
and there's 500 people sitting there. And I look around and I'm surrounded by people that, you know, are like just white. I mean, as an Asian woman, like I just get that feeling of, oh, whether it's intentional or unintentional, there is that feeling of, oh, I'm not welcome in this space, right? I am not invited. And I think if you're white, like you've never, like that experience doesn't happen all that often. So it like, it's hard to even imagine what that would be like, right? But yes. really diversity and inclusion is about creating spaces where everyone can feel included. And part of feeling included is being able to look around the room and see people that look like you. So, you know, I think that's really kind of important for the organizers to keep in mind. Fair. Okay. So do you think there's an effective diversity ratio for program panels? Or is this more about like the spirit of the matter than actually trying for specific numbers? Yeah. And I think it's really just about creating a space where everyone can feel that sense of belonging, where they feel welcomed. I don't think it's about the numbers. And I think actually, if you just try to focus too much on the numbers, sometimes that can backfire. Like I've literally gotten emails that says, oh, you know, we're putting on this panel and we've realized we have all white men. Can you talk (laughs) on, on this topic of like constitutional law? And I'm like, I don't know anything about constitutional law. Like you shouldn't invite me. That's, that's a terrible reason to invite me. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So, you know, I think it's really important not to just go by the numbers, but really, you know, think about, you know, what is your intention behind trying to create more diversity and inclusion within your conference and, you know, kind of move with that intention and not just being like, okay, you know, we need a certain number of, you know, these folks and these folks and these folks. Excellent. So I thought this was a pretty good discussion. I'm glad we got the word out there. Let's hope there'll be more diverse panels more diverse organizations in the future. But sadly, we've talked for a while, and that's going to do it for another episode of the Legal Toolkit. So I'll be back on future shows with further insights into my soul, the soul of America, and the legal market. But if you're feeling nostalgic for my dulcet tones, however, you can check out our entire show archive anytime you want at LegalTalkNetwork.com. Gene, I was just happy that we didn't even mention Donald Trump once until now during this podcast. I'm very pleased about that. (laughs) Um, So let me say thank you to Gina Cho of JC Law Group for guesting on the show today. Gina, can you tell folks a bit more about you, your various projects, and where to find more information about you? Because we already know you don't know anything about constitutional law which is fine. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, you can learn more about me. I'm, I'm actually launching a daily six-minute mindfulness program for lawyers starting in January called Mindful Pause. And you can learn more about that on Gina Cho, J-E-E-N-A-C-H-O.com. I'm also very active on Twitter, Gina underscore Cho. Don't look at the Gina Cho all one word because it's owned by somebody else. That's not me. <laughs> okay. Two things to remember. Gina, J-E-E-N-A, And do not look at the other Gina Cho Twitter profile. (laughs) Thanks again, Gina. Thanks so much for having me. And this was Gina Cho of JC Law Group PC and other uh, things that she's been doing as you've heard throughout this broadcast. Finally, thanks all of you out there for listening. And remember, never look a bull weevil directly in the eye if you don't have a small head of cabbage in your pocket. You'll thank me later. Talk to you next time. Thanks for listening to Legal Toolkit, produced by the broadcast professionals at Legal Talk Network. Join host Jared Correa for his next podcast covering the current business trends for law firms. If you'd like more information about today's show, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS. Find Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Or download the free app from Legal Talk Network in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.